There is a very old joke. Scientists determine that within two weeks the entire world will be destroyed by a catastrophic flood. Not one inch of land will remain. The entire planet will be totally underwater. There is nothing that can be done to prevent this disaster. So all the great religions convene their greatest leaders and they discuss how to prepare their flocks for the end. Some preach repentance and some speak of an afterlife. Others speak of acceptance and self-control. But the rabbis have a different take. The rabbis go to their communities and say, listen people, we have two weeks to learn how to live underwater. Of course, the joke is about a serious topic, Jewish survival. Given our history, it was meant to be a humorous way to describe how we have gotten through the pathos of the ages. And in our age, I think it is a fitting description of how we have adapted to the realities of our times. It is sometimes said that a crisis never made a person. It only reveals who that person already is. The thought is both comforting and frightening because right now we are all living lives of uncertainty. We worry that everything we hold dear may one day be no more. We fear we may need to learn to live underwater. Is it all slipping away from us, our families, our health, our careers, our futures, our savings, our lives. Today we welcome the new year as we do every year by reading the unusual three-day journey of Abraham and Isaac that nearly early on ends the Jewish people. Every year I wish we could read just a little further, for in the very next chapter of the Torah, there is a beautiful, almost surreal comment about Sarah, our matriarch, the beloved wife of Abraham. Rashi, as he analyzes her life, writes, All of Sarah's years were equally good. Equally good. Let us recall Sarah's life. Abraham moves Sarah from the luxury of the city of Ur to the struggle and hardship of nomadic life. To protect himself, Abraham lies to Pharaoh, saying Sarah is his sister and not his wife. Thereupon, Pharaoh takes Sarah as a concubine. Sarah struggles for years with infertility. Sarah gives Abraham her servant Hagar to have a child fulfilling his covenant with God. And then out of jealousy, Sarah insists Abraham send Hagar and their child Ishmael away into the wilderness. Sarah dies moments after she learns that Abraham almost killed their only son, Isaac. Good? I do not think so. Rather, Sarah and Abraham lived a life of difficulty and uncertainty. They both died filled with unmet needs and dashed hopes. It is hard to paper over the reality. God promises Abraham seven times that he will have the land of Canaan as his possession and his children's inheritance. But when Sarah dies, he cannot bury her as he has not secured his own land. When Abraham dies, not one of the vows that God promised was achieved. How can the Bible comment, when Abraham dies, that his life was fulfilled? He and Sarah were examples of being vulnerable. How is this commentary possible? I believe because it is human nature to always look back and remember the good, 
to tell our stories from retrospect, from positions of strength. For our ancestors and for us, there are no guarantees. We are promised things, and while some come to fruition, many never materialize. Dismay and disappointment often rule the day, and yet, when we reach the end, we have the benefit of perspective. We look back on our lives, like God looked back on creation, and we say, Yitov, it was good. Uncertain, yes, painful at times, but good, and that must be enough. Earlier this year, I read a wonderful book, A Gentleman in Moscow. It is the kind of book you can't put down. The story involves a man in communist Russia just after the Bolshevik Revolution. He must stand before a tribunal. They spare his life, but sentence him to house arrest. He must live the remainder of his days, one might suggest, quarantined in a hotel room. If he leaves the hotel, he could be shot as an outlaw. I must admit, partway through the book, I I just had to know if he was going to make it out of that hotel room. So I confess, I flipped to the final pages to see what happened. Do not worry, I will not spoil it for you, and you really should read this book. Knowing how the story would end helped move me through the literary tension. I was uncomfortable with uncertainty. I just had to know, so I peeked. Isn't it too bad we cannot do this in life, especially in the life we are living today, when the stress is just too much? Wouldn't you like to know how everything is going to turn out? What will need to happen so that we can integrate the obstacles of living and deem our lives good? So many questions. What will happen when the restrictions are lifted? Who knows? When will we be able to pray in synagogue in person together? No idea. What will a post-COVID-19 world look like? We can only guess. What will happen on November 3rd and the days and weeks following? It is all so uncertain. We gather this morning at the end of the longest six months many of us remember. We know only one thing, one thing for certain. If someone was asked in 2015 where they would be in five years, there is no way know how they could have ever imagined where we are today. The only thing today that is certain is uncertainty. There is a wonderful story about King Saul, the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel. The Philistines are mustering for war and Saul does not know what to do. In his desperation, he consults the witch of Endor. No, not the leader of the fictional moon in the Star Wars universe, but a sorceress who is able to communicate with the dead. Saul wants to know what the future holds and has her summon up the dead spirit of Samuel the prophet. Now Samuel does show up, but he does not give Saul the answer Saul was hoping for. Saul was uncomfortable not knowing Saul wanted to be in control. Don't we all? We want to chart our course and be sure of our destination. We yearn for clarity. We want reassurance, a promise. But that is not the way life works. Life comes to us one day at a time. It brings gifts and it brings burdens. And even amid uncertainty and chaos, The miracle of our humanity is that against all odds, we persistently search for hope. In his book, The Art of Uncertainty, Dennis Merritt Jones writes, 
between a shaky world economy, increasing unemployment, and other issues, many today are being forced to come to the edge of uncertainty. Just like baby sparrows, we find ourselves leaning into the mystery that change brings. Because we have no choice. It's fly or die. Dr. Ann Mastin, a professor at the University of Minnesota, known for her research on the development of resilience, recently wrote, With the f while the phrase adjusting to the new normal has been repeated endlessly since March, it's easier said than done. How do you adjust to an ever-changing situation where the new normal is indefinite uncertainty? These past six months have brought an unprecedented disaster for most of us that is profound in its impact on our daily lives, says Mastin. But it's different from a hurricane or tornado. You can look outside and see the damage. The devastation of COVID-19 is, for most people, invisible, internal, and ongoing. Dr. Pauline Boss, a family therapist and researcher, also at the University of Minnesota, specializes in ambiguous loss, which she defines as any loss that is inexplicable or lacks resolution. It can be physical, such as a missing person or an individual's loss of a limb or organ, or psychological, such as a family member who struggles with dementia or a serious addiction. Boss writes, in this time of uncertainty, we are experiencing a loss of a way of life, of the ability to meet up with our friends and extended family, a loss of trust in our government. It's the loss of our freedom to move about in our daily life. I suggest that it is also the loss of education as we know it. It is the loss of rituals such as b'nai mitzvah, weddings, graduations, and funerals, and even our personal routines such as going to the gym. These are rituals too. Boss writes, these were all things we were attached to and fond of, and they're gone right now. So the loss is ambiguous. What we used to have has been taken away from us. Ambiguous loss elicits the same experiences of grief and mourning as the death of someone close to us. But managing ambiguous loss requires something slightly different. Ambiguous loss asks us to be creative, and it demands that we have hope. Here are some thoughts from my reading and research that may be helpful as we navigate this journey together, and yet standing six feet apart. First, we must all accept that life is very different right now. As Abraham and Sarah had to do when God told them to leave the wealth and wonder of the city of Ur and go someplace unknown to them, we have to say to ourselves, it's a difficult time. This is hard. We have to accept that in our bones and be okay with this as a tough time. And that's the way it is. And accept good enough as a baseline. Second, we must all expect less from ourselves. The first Jewish president is elected. He calls his mother, Mama, I've won the election. You've got to come to the swearing-in ceremony. I, I don't know. What would I wear? Don't worry, I'll send you a dressmaker. But, but I only eat kosher food. Mama, I'm going to be the president. I can get you kosher food. But how will I get there? I'll send a limo, Mama. Just come. Okay, okay, if it makes you happy. The great day comes, and Mama is seated between the Supreme Court justices and the future cabinet members. She nudges gently the gentleman on her right, and she says, 
You see that boy, the one with his hand on the Bible? His brother's a doctor. This is a difficult one for us Jews, but we must expect less of ourselves and even expect less of our children. We need to become reacquainted with our lives and the absence of systems and traditions that have broken down. Whether it's schools, hospitals, churches, family supports, and so on, we are grieving multiple losses while simultaneously managing the daily impact of trauma and uncertainty. And no one, no one can function at full capacity with all that is going on. Third, we must recognize the different aspects of grief. Pauline Boss writes that the familiar stages of grief about which Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote do not actually occur on a linear timeline, but we can ultimately expect to meet them, all of them, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. They will all come to us at some point. Sometimes acceptance means saying we're going to have a good time in spite of this, and at other times it indicates an acknowledgement that we cannot change the situation right now. But rather than proclaiming never, we show acceptance and hope by always saying not yet. And finally, we must focus on maintaining and strengthening the relationships of our lives. Our ability to face adversity and build resilience is strongly dependent on social support and remaining connected to people. And that includes helping others, even when we're feeling depleted ourselves. Masson explains that gathering in community is action. We have much more control over our lives and our world when we stand together. Helping others could include checking in on family friends or buying groceries for an elderly neighbor. It could also include physical distancing and dining in our neighbor's driveway or a walk in the park with a close friend. Will we succumb to depression and despair? Will we fritter our way our time fretting about the many forces that at any moment have the power to destroy us? Or will we live up to our history of tradition and change, take control, join together, and proceed with resolved optimism? Will we learn to live underwater? In ancient days, at this time of year, the Jewish communities would find two identical goats to use as sacrifices on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. One goat was to be an offering to God on the sacred altar, symbolic of wholeness and purity. And the other was pushed off of a cliff, representing the casting away of negative energy and sin. One goat represented an offering of repentance on the holiest day. The other goat represented the darker side of life. The, some ti the times of suffering and misery. At this time, Rabbi Yehoshua would tell his people never to lose hope. He explained that the two goats were metaphors for our lives. We are placed on earth to enjoy the transcendent moments, the celebration and gratitude that we wait for and work to enjoy. These counterbalance those times when pain and suffering overwhelm us. All we can do is move through the wilderness and the darkness with only the memory of better times to guide us along our journeys. But then, from within the pain, there will appear a streak of clarity. It is at the very core of darkness that we create infinite possibility and endless light. Faith sees best in the dark. These two goats are exactly the same, and the moral is that we are the same too. We are all creatures of darkness and light, wholeness and brokenness, sickness and health. 
We transgress and we achieve. Our lives are moving pictures that alternate with the times and seasons. But we are all from the same source, and we must lean on one another and our shared humanity and reach toward light and hope toward good. On this new year, may we know acceptance and satisfaction and goodness. May the threat of floods and storms and fires and illness not overwhelm us, but help us return to God and to our true selves. Amen. <laughs>